I could have been an actress, just like my family for the last three generations. Or I could have been a wildlife protector. Since I was born, I had a fatal attraction to animals, and I kid you not, it's mutual, the feeling. <laughs> but um, I studied architecture, so you would think I'm an architect. I'm not any of that today. I decided to spend my life in technology, and you must wonder why. I think we live in the most interesting times ever. We build tools and technologies that not only enable us to do things faster and easier and more practical, but they let us do things we never thought we could do. They let us go beyond the edge, enable us in places where, while we were building those tools, we never thought somebody would even go. So today I would like to share with you just one of the many ways how technology can impact our lives and why it keeps on seducing me. I come from the design technology world. I work with teams that make software that helps creative professionals imagine, design, and create the world around us. But curiously, almost every design software starts like this. It's a blank screen. Now, aside from the fact that that is very intimidating, it's actually not really logical, because everything that we do is for this reality. If I design a building, it's in some city. If I design a coffee shop, it's probably in a building. If I design somebody's prosthetics, it's for somebody's body. Yet that reality is missing. It's missing in this blank screen. So for the longest of time, it was really difficult to digitize the analog world around us so that we can then put it in computer and do all the magic with it. Well, until 10 years ago, when laser scanners were invented. And what the laser scanner does, it, it shoots beams in space, it hits the surface, records the information about that surface, sends it back to the, um, to the scanner, and what we receive is something that we call a point cloud. It's a cloud of points that basically um, know their location in space, but they're, uh, and, and it looks like 3D, but it's not really 3D. But hey, we digitize the reality. It's now in the computer, and we can do something with it. What happened in the last 10 years is that uh, all of these scanners have become much easier to use, much faster, much better, and much cheaper. But then a myriad of new sensoring devices like Kinects and handheld scanners, etc., have appeared. What also happened then that the software that represented, that made sense of what the scanner was capturing, instead of black and white and sparse point cloud, it looks like this. Today, this is how a scanner looks like. So it's almost like you're feeling that you're in the real space. These were seven scans that we took at the tech shop in San Francisco. And now, why is this important? Because now an architect, instead of spending time recreating the reality in which they're working, they would immediately just start designing within that reality that is just brought inside of the computer. But as I said, this is not just for the usual suspects, architects and engineers, etc. Uh, many other industries can leverage from this. Um, heritage is really important. I'm very excited about the fact that for the first time we can actually uh, start saving our heritage in much more massive way. Many more participants can take part simply because it's much easier and it's much more powerful. So what do we do when we capture it? Well, we can, of course, keep it for, as an archive for the future generations, but we can also snapshot in time so we can tell the difference if something is degrading, if something needs to be paid attention to. And, of course, it's a new base of documentation so that you can restore it unlike what normally archaeologists still do, measure manually, etc. But there is an even easier way to digitize the world around us, and that is, photo that is with the method of photogrammetry. What photogrammetry does is it converts normal photos into detailed 3D digital models. It sounds like magic. It actually really is. So this is... Um, <laughs> Um, this is a building in Calistoga. We took about 40 photos, and this is what we got, a 3D model, just done out of the photos. The next one is a dragon panel from Singapore. It was under a roof in a temple, and my colleague Ronald and I really loved it, and we put the camera on a monopod and took about 40 photos clicking from down there, and we made this beautiful 3D model from the uh, panel. This example maybe uh, will tell you the most uh, what's possible with this technology. This is a little Krishna statue that was at my friend Sunil's house. We were waiting for dinner, and we took about 70 photos with um, a pocket camera, and this is what we got back. It's just unbelievable the level of detail that you can get now from mere photos. Um, 
And those of you, by the way, who know the, how to design in computer from scratch, something like this will take you three to four weeks to do. For us, it took, took us about 10 minutes to take the photos, send it to the cloud, and you get this automatically calculated by the computer. Now, I couldn't resist to also show you this one, although it's fresh from the oven. And uh, it's, um, according to my knowledge, the first 3D model of an insect made with macro photography. Our friends at Giga Macro, it's a Napa-based company, they're making these rigs for automatic taking of photos of insects. And imagine all the collections of insects being now able to, to uh, experience them like this and to learn from them like this. It's quite amazing. So how is all this done? It cannot be done simpler than this. You take photos, you can use your iPhone, you can use your pocket camera, or you can use a good big camera. Really, the difference will be the level of detail. With all of them, it will be possible. You upload it to the cloud because the software resides on the cloud, and after about an hour or so, you get this. You get a 3D, beautiful digital model, beautiful digitized reality of that object. What can you do with it? You can then use it either um, to tell a story about it on the web, or in movies, in games, or like I did with one click, I said, please 3D print it, and you can see it actually outside. Now, what I love about the method of, phot of photogrammetry is that it doesn't only let us digitize the world that exists around us, but also uh, the things that don't exist anymore. Now, before you think that I've been drinking, let me explain. <laughs> this is the famous colossal Bamiyan Buddha in Afghanistan. These are Buddhas that were carved on a cliff. They were gorgeous. And for whatever reason, political or religious, we will never know, Taliban bombed them. Um, the world was very sad because this is all that remained. It was, it's a hole. And because there was almost no documentation about this. Well, the world was wrong. There is a documentation. And who did it? All of us. Any one of us who went to Afghanistan and took some photos, we went like tourists, and took some photos of the Bamiyan Buddha and uploaded them on the web. We could now download those photos, and with a little bit more work than what I showed you before, we got this. This is a 3D digital model of something that, that does not exist anymore. I don't know about you, but I get a kick out of this. <laughs> now, in the past year, I was really lucky to work with some amazing people who took these technologies to bring their professions to the edge. And I would like to share with you their stories. The first one is about the Leakey family. Many of you might have heard of the a famous Leakey family that in six decades and three generations have been uncovering, understanding, and uh, promoting the story of evolution. In, within the three generations, they have gathered thousands of fossils of the first hominids, of the first animals, of the first tools that are today safely stored in the National Museum in Nairobi and in the Turkwana Base Institute. One of the most important motto for the Leakey family was to share with the world their findings. But they were quite frustrated because they knew that um, where the, the, the fossils are, it's not very accessible. Not, we don't go to Kenya every day. So Louis Leakey, a third generation of this family and a dear friend of mine, set upon to solve this. And inspired by this new design technolo digitizing technology, she started the modest efforts to digitize the fossils. From those modest efforts, this is where she is today. She has her fossils digitized in a beautiful way. Imagine this is still just done from photos. It's crazy. And um, once she digitized them, she wanted to share them with the world, so uh, she and her team made a beautiful site, africanfossils.org, where you can interactively explore the Turquana Base Institute, pick any of the fossils, and start viewing it, uh, understanding it better. You can learn about the origins, you can learn about which uh, species does it belong to, also, you can look either for animals, or for hominids, or for tools, or if you're interested in a certain period of time. It's fun. It's, it's uh, learning in a new way. The site also enables you to compare the skulls. So, for example, on your left is the modern skull, us, and the other one is about two million years old. And you would think our heads are bigger and our brains are bigger, and then we were, we were probably thinking better. Not sure about that. but. This is how you learn now. 
Uh, Louis Leak also allows you to download any of the 3D digital skulls, so you can 3D print them if you're an educator, or you can make these uh, beautiful cardboard puzzles. So now you would ask yourself, is this a game or is this education? Well, it's both. Science can be fun, and this is exactly due to the fact that the technology enables it. The next story is about corals. Corals are gorgeous, and they are a really important natural resource. They contain uh, levels of biodiversity that is comparable with the rainforest. But unfortunately, due to pollution, uh, acidification of the ocean, raising temperature of the ocean, overfishing, fishing in a destructive manner, the corals are really under threat. And it seems that um, the whole education and the research around corals is, is kind of in, in its infancy. There is no cost-effective method to measure the growth of the corals, which is the basic parameter to tell us if they're healthy or not, if our ocean is healthy or not. So this is what the young team of environmental scientists at the Hydro US decided to change. So they set up office, this is their office, and this is their workplace, and equipped with an um, underwater camera, a lot of knowledge and a lot of goodwill, they started capturing corals. This is a video of the capture, but this is already the captured coral. You cannot even tell the difference. So we now have these 3D digital models of the corals that are invaluable resource for scientists, marine scientists, and um, uh, others to start measuring the corals, understanding them, tracking them throughout time, because you can uh, make captures every month and then see how it changes. But also, just simple as this, Corals are drop-dead gorgeous, but only those who actually have the guts to go scuba diving can enjoy them. Well, these guys now are offering the, those captured corals on their website so you can see them, explore them, and fall in love with them and hopefully care about them in the future. The next story is about Egyptian mummies. Now, we're not going to Egypt, we're going to Stockholm in Sweden because the Mediterranean Museum in Stockholm has a beautiful collection of over a thousand artifacts from Egyptian civilization. They were preparing a new exhibition last year, and they really wanted to use tech to make some new experiences in the museum, but also find new ways to teach about this amazing culture. So uh, they partnered with a local partner, ICT Swedish Institute, who invited us to make something awesome. So we got Mr. Nesviao, an uh, Egyptian priest, in all its grandeur, and this is what we did to him. We first put him in a CAT scanner, uh, so we made the tomography, and then we started taking photos of the rest of uh, the, the sarcophagus. So what we ended up with is this, a 3D digital model of the body, of the mummified body, the cartonage, the first sarcophagi, the second sarcophagi. Basically, we got digitized the entire sarcophagi. So what with it? We made this gorgeous interactive table that allows museum visitors, and this is, by the way, the insider explorer that ICT is so uh, great in doing, it allows you in the museum to actually digitally unwrap the mummy, look at it in detail, explore it, see how it was done. Uh, if you know how to read hieroglyphs, you can zoom in and you can actually read something that behind the glass in the museum you could not do anything with. It's quite amazing. And because it was digital, we could 3D print it. So we 3D printed them and we can put them together like Russian babushka dolls. <laughs> now, the one interesting thing was that um, uh, when we CAT scanned the mummy, we found, the, the, the scientists found 120 hidden objects under the wrappings, amulets. And because we digitized everything, we could actually 3D print the amulets. Actually, this is, uh, we 3D printed the negative, the cast, and then we were pouring in metal, and we were all wearing them at the opening. Um, I was at the opening, and I cannot tell you the joy to see how kids reacted to this. For them, you can say, oh, it was a game. Who cares if it was a game? They were learning. They loved it. And instead of seeing, mommy, let's leave from the museum, it was the opposite. The parents were like, come on, no, I want this. And they were like, don't touch it. I know how to do this. They, they really <laughs> loved it. The last story is about the, the Smithsonian. Smithsonian is the biggest collection of museums in the world. They have 19 museums and 137 million objects. But if you're somebody like me who loves going to museums, this is what you see, 2%. There's simply not enough buildings, not enough space to showcase everything. So they wanted to change this. How to, uh, to offer all the collection to everybody who comes to the museum, but 
to everybody who doesn't come to the museum, who will never make it in DC or New York or elsewhere. They also wanted to find a way to be relevant to the digital kids who are only interested to, to look at screens. So, Vince Rossi and Adam Metallo, the laser cowboys of the digitization office in the Smithsonian, led by Günther Weibel, they decided to try it out. They tested every single capturing device. They were learning by doing. They didn't know. And somewhere along that way, our paths crossed. And when you put many good minds together, something beautiful comes out. What we made is something for you all. It's called Smithsonian 3D, X3D. And basically, it's the window into the future. It shows you how museums in the future would look like. We picked about 20 objects from as little as a bit to as big as a supernova remnant, digitized them, and then put them in something that is called the Smithsonian Explorer. So basically, you go on the site, you pick any of the objects that you see. This is the life mask of Abraham Lincoln. You can explore it in all its glory. It's as beautiful as in real life. You can visualize it in different methods, depending if you're a scientist and you need research methods, etc. If you're a teacher at school and you're teaching about mammoths, why teach from boring books? Why not just open one of the digital libraries from the Smithsonian and ask the kids to measure how big were they? But we don't have to be so serious. We can also make art. We can make a sticker for a t-shirt that is my mammoth. That can be also nice. I love this story. This is a cosmic Buddha. It's one in the world. It tells the story of Buddha on a relief, uh, but the relief was very shallow, and the curator could not necessarily see all the details. Well, because it's digitized, we could actually make the relief deeper, and the curator could read it. He was amazed. We won his heart over. So this tool is not only for all of you to learn with your kids, for, for educators to also teach with additional 3D digitized library, but it was also for the curators to be able to tell their stories. Some of them, like Peter Jacobs, he spent his entire life learning about the rights flyer. So now he can use a digital language because we made it so easy that he can tell the story to all of us. And whatever you liked, you can also change it, make some art, share it with the rest of the world. It's simply amazing, and I invite all of you um, to check it out. Because everything was digitized, now scientists can use it to make 3D models instead of the complicated plaster models that they were doing and use it for research. Or you can download any of the models and play with it, learn about it, make cardboard models, etc. And because it's digital, we could also do some other stuff. We could make the negative of the digital and make custom crates, which is also a problem in the museum. These things cost a lot of money to make one thing for one thing. Now, this is $70 and my invaluable time, and um, <laughs> we did a crate. To finish, we call this concept rip, fix, burn, or rip, mod, fab. We can rip the reality, we can fix it, mix it, and then we can re-burn it back into the real life. Or rip, fix, and learn. We can rip it, we can fix it, and we can learn, we can teach. We can learn from our past, we can learn about our past, so that we maybe make a better future. Thank you.